great. So um, before we get started, um, can you guys just talk to me a little bit about maybe what your experience is working with kids or even adults with tick disorder or Tourette? Any of you had experiences before with this population? I see a head shake. No, no. No. Okay. Uh, I think the only time it's come up for me has just been like if I have a kid with ADHD in clinic and I'm you know worried about like exacerbating an underlying tick disorder, then I start to think about it. But other than that, not really any true diagnosed disorders. Got it. I had one with um, Tourette's, but that was when I was in middle school. I'm sorry, middle school. Med school. Okay. Um, and he wasn't like the classic, like he was cursing out and everything, but um, he he was um, kind of, he had those little ticks where he was just like, uh, and like mm -hmm. really, yeah, I just, I, I can remember it vividly. I just can't really explain it that well, but he would just like freeze up and like, he wants to say something, but he does. He can't. I guess that's like how I would, and that's how he would explain to me when I was in med school. Perfect. That makes sense to me. Uh, so, my 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 computer just randomly locked. Hold on one second. All right, that was odd. Okay, great. Okay. So it sounds like some of you have maybe had one or two experiences. Some of you have had none, and so this will be a very informative presentation. Um, and so what I really want to communicate to you is that patients with ticks are really everywhere. It's what we need to ask for this diagnosis to be more apparent in what you do in your practices. Um, and so let me start my slideshow here. Let me know if you can see it moving. Can you see it moving? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay. So the um, title of this presentation is Tick Disorders, and I want to focus on etiology, assessment, and treatment. Um, so by the end of this presentation, what I want you um, to have at least some introductory knowledge of is what the DSM criteria is for ticks, um, to describe what the etiology is of ticks, and to describe the tick course and comorbidity, and understand the core components of what we consider treatment line one, which is CBIT, as a treatment option for ticks. Um, given the training experiences that you guys have had, for me as a pediatric psychologist, what I really want to emphasize is there's a difference between knowing medically what a tick disorder is and being able to confidently explain it to a child in a developmentally appropriate way. So you guys are all outstanding scientists. You can probably give me the, neuro like the neurological background of what a tick disorder is, but for a high stress family that is getting this diagnosis for the first time, being able to communicate that in a developmentally appropriate way is really the key take home from this presentation. So just a little bit of history about Tourette disorder. So the very, very first um, tick that was ever written down was in this book called Witch's Hammer. And it was written by Jacob Sprenger in the 15th century. Um, and uh, in that book, it described that ticks were probably related to a possession of the devil. So a lot of our early, you know, a lot of our early medical diagnosis we could treat to, you know, we could align it with devil taking over. Then uh, Jean-Martin uh, Charcot, he was a French uh, physician, and his resident, uh, Georges-Albert-Edouard Brute Gilles de la Tourette, um, studied patients with these ticks in a Parisian hospital. And so Charcot named uh, the diagnosis Tourette syndrome on behalf of his resident. I love pointing this out to my residents and fellows. That would be like if you guys were training and you were the first to see something, and then we honored you by calling it the Sean Tams disorder, right? So Tourette syndrome is just basically named after the French guy that found it. This often is a misnomer with families because they think Tourette is obviously something in the brain or the body, but my patients that go through CBIT, we know that it's just an old French guy. Um, he wrote about Tourette syndrome for the first time um, in, a in a book called The Study of a Nervous Affliction. So he described nine uh, patients in that book with a convulsive tick disorder. So even early back in the 1800s, we knew that this tick presentation was connected to something associated with anxiety or nervousness. So this is a true story. I go to the Tourette Association conference every other year, and there are literally fights with neurology nerds about this. You know, what do we call this diagnosis? Is it Tourette disorder? Is it Tourette's 
like ownership disorder? Is it Tourette's syndrome? Is it named in full Gilles de la Tourette syndrome? This is kind of a tomato tomato situation. And so again, to be developmentally informed with my patients, I sometimes will ask them, what do you want to call this? And so if they say Tourette disorder, I try very hard to call it Tourette disorder throughout treatment, right? Prior to the changes in the DSM, it actually was called Gilles de la Tourette syndrome. But obviously, that's a whole lot of words for our often pediatric condition. So it was thinned out to Tourette disorder and Tourette syndrome in 2010. So this is actually the DSM diagnosis of Tourette syndrome and Tourette disorder. Um, as Sean probably knows, the biggest change from the DSM-4 to the DSM-5 was the removal of functional impairment. And that isn't just for tic disorders, that's for a lot of diagnoses like ADHD as well. You don't have to now be functionally impaired by your tics to meet criteria for a tic disorder. That's really important, I think, for you guys, especially my medical students and residents on the call, that if the patient isn't aware that they're ticking, if the tics are present, they have a tic disorder, you know, regardless of if they know it or if they're impaired by it. Does that make sense? Do you guys uh -huh. have a question about that? Uh -uh. Okay. So when you look under the umbrella of tick disorders, if somebody has Tourette's disorder, what that means, or Tourette's syndrome or Tourette's disorder, they have multiple motor tics and at least one vocal tic. Those tics have been around for a year. They occur before age 18, and they're not attributable to other physiological effects of like a substance or a medical condition, okay? Medically, this is probably one of the easiest diagnoses you guys will make, right? Chronic uh, motor tics, yes. Vocal tics, yes. Have they been around longer than a year? Yes. Is the child under 18? Yes. That's correct. That's all we need is that the tic count, okay? If somebody has chronic motor or chronic vocal tics, what that means is they exclusively either have motor tics or they exclusively only have vocal tics, okay? <laughs> This is a huge um, clarification for you guys because sometimes families hear Tourette syndrome and they think like, oh, that must be the worst type of tic disorder. And this chronic motor vocal tic must be like, you know, Tourette disorder light. That's actually not true at all. I've had patients that have such profound motor tics or such profound vocal tics, they can't sit in a chair or hold a conversation, right? But because they don't have one or two of the other type of tic, they would get a chronic motor tic disorder, where maybe a patient that has two motor tics and one vocal tic, they would have Tourette syndrome. So you can see, like, there's a huge difference between Tourette disorder and chronic motor and vocal tic disorder, but it's not severity, it's just symptom count. I give provisional tic disorders when it's kind of like a smell like. Like, do I think they have tic disorder? Yes. Did they first notice their tics maybe six months ago? Yes. So I will give a provisional tic disorder until we hit that year mark. Again. So now to make this a little bit more complicated, you guys have started to already hear me use these words, right? We have this phenomena of tics, and then we have motor tics, and then what's called vocal, phonic, or verbal tics. Again, that's a tomato tomato situation. Those words are often used very interchangeably. Um, and then within motor and vocal and verbal and phonic tics, we have simple tics and complex, complex tics. Simple tics is when it's a single muscle group or a single sound. Complex is when we have kind of a series of tics together. So maybe it's a facial grimace, a blink, and then a throat clear, right? A simple motor tic might be something just like a blink or an utterance, right? Does that make sense to you guys? Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. When we look at the course of this diagnosis, most patients with Tourette syndrome have multiple types of tics, right? I think in my, we're almost getting no joke, up to 400 patients that have gone through CBIT, most patients have motor tics and vocal tics. It's for me more rare to diagnose chronic motor or chronic vocal tic disorder than Tourette syndrome. True. Tics occur in waves. Ticks vary in frequency and intensity, right? And so sometimes what happens is I'll have a patient that waited, you know, two years on the wait list, receive it treatment. By the time they get to me, it's like their ticks aren't even there, right? If they had ticks at any point in their life, regardless of intensity, they still have Tourette syndrome, even if the ticks dissipate and disappear. Okay. Ticks wax and wane. They always worsen in times of stress. 
when we think about the concept of stress, we're thinking about the physiological concept of stress. So what that means is the child might not be experiencing negative stress, which is called distress. They might be really excited, right? So I have a, a boom of patients that want to come back and see me for boosters when it's Christmas time, when it's near their birthday, you know, uh, when the new school year is starting and they're super excited about their teacher. Because physiologically, the body doesn't know the difference between de-stress, negative stress, and you stress. Um, children's first, oh, go ahead. I can't see your face while I'm presenting. So if you if you have any questions or anything, just interrupt me and talk, okay? Sounds good. Okay. Um, uh, patients usually have their first tick about age four to six, but often when I'm doing an intake with patients, parents can remember even very early on, maybe their baby doing body tensing or their toddler blinking. So usually the first identifiable one is between four and six, but very common to hear earlier. Often it might start with a motor tick and then lead to a vocal tick. Often it might start in the head and face and move to the body. But again, there's no rules in the wild west of Tourette syndrome. Sometimes what will happen is we start with a simple tick. So maybe we do a throat clear and then it grows into a complex. So maybe our throat clear then becomes a throat clear and then a shoulder pop. So now we're in the complex world. Peak severity is often during mid-teens. And so obviously there must be something with the introduction of hormones into the body that impacts uh, mid-teenagers with their tick presentation. Um, and when they look at ticks um, and puberty, what they have found is that 33% of patients that have Tourette syndrome, their ticks uh, decrease or dissipate after adolescence. 33% stay the same and 33% their ticks actually get worse. And so statistically, this is an incredible phenomena that we have this perfect 33, 33, 33, <laughs> which really captures that this is considered a chronic diagnosis. Developmentally, something I want to teach you guys, and Sean will see me do this directly this year. When children have a chronic diagnosis, I tell them that. And so that can be kind of provocative, right? Because that often is a very hard conversation to tell a patient that diabetes is long, like lifelong or Tourette syndrome is lifelong. But I feel like having that open-ended conversation with kids, we're establishing rapport and we're putting expectation management on this diagnosis, right? You'll see, we're gonna talk a little bit about superpowers. So I have a way to do this, but I tell patients right off the bat that this is a chronic diagnosis and ticks may go up and may decrease or you might never have one ever again after CBIT and that's okay because you're still part of our mothership, you're still part of the club. So this is something I love sharing. I wish I could see your faces on the screen. Ticks are present in 10 to 25% of school age children. So ticks are actually considered the most common pediatric phenomena over ADHD, over other behavioral disorders, over anxiety. Jeez. So while you haven't seen it a lot now, after this presentation, I guarantee you, you're going to start seeing ticks <laughs> everywhere. I guarantee it, right? Because it's almost like I'm priming you with this information, right? <laughs> this is the reason why poor Sean will learn this quickly, why our wait list right now is about to hit two and a half years to get into CBIT treatment. Jeez. Yes, because it's so common, right? And yet it's so understudied and undertrained in medicine that if there is somebody that has a certification or expertise in Tourette syndrome, this is what the average wait list looks like nationally. Um, prevalence is obviously lower in adults and boys are four to five times greater than girls to have tick disorder. You kind of alluded to this, I think it was Francis, um, that Often, we can do a pretty good job knowing if a child has a tick disorder if they have any of the other three diagnoses listed here. So if you have a patient in your office that has ADHD symptoms and maybe has a flavor of anxiety, you can kind of bet your bank account that they probably have ticks. So when I am training residents or fellows and they're shadowing me, I look like the most awesome attending ever when I'm like, this is kind of an out there question. I know you said they're kind of inattentive. I know you said that they are worried about germs. Do they ever do things over and over again with their body or their voice that they can't help? And that parent's always like, man, how did you know that? That's what I was gonna talk about next. That's because this is considered the diagnostic triad. You really can't have two of these without three or four of these. Okay. 
So when we're making a differential diagnosis, so when we're trying to think of is this a tick disorder or is this something else, these are just a couple things to kind of keep in mind. And for those of you that want to keep this PowerPoint, I can also send this to Anna so that you have this. So for example, OCD, right? So OCD is an obsessive intrusive thought and then a related compulsive behavior, right? OCD and ticks can get a little bit gray because we kind of have this feeling of needing to do something, right? So maybe if I pop my shoulder on my right side, I have this overwhelming desire to pop it on my left side. That gets a little bit tricky with if we're in the OCD territory or if we're in the tick territory, right? Hyperactivity would be another differential we would look at, right? So if I have an ADHD patient that's hyperactivity symptoms that are foot tapping, that's gonna look really similar to maybe a foot tapping tick. Conduct disorder is something else I kind of keep in mind. Patients um, with Tourette syndrome often have something called rage attacks where they might get explosively mad and disrespectful, settle down quite quickly, but that could also look like coprolalia, right? Which is kind of what you guys reference that explosive swearing, right? Another thing that often looks very similar to tick disorder is something called Sydenham's chorea, right? That's brought on by rheumatic fever. Those are kind of continually flowing movements instead of those rapid kind of irregular tick-like movements. And then finally, the other one is stereotypies, right? So stereotypic movements, right? There's, it's off, that's often a younger uh, onset. There's no urge. It's more of a fixed pattern. And often patients that are engaging in stereotypic movements describe that as enjoyable. Or if you ask the patient with fix if, that, if it's an enjoyable experience, they would probably say absolutely not. So if I was presenting in front of you, I would do something evil to you guys, but I won't do it. It would be really cool to do, but I won't do it. Um, when I am trying to explain what a tick is, maybe to a parent that doesn't understand what their child is going through, I will actually make the parent and child do a staring contest with each other. So I will have the parent keep their eyes open as long as they possibly can, and I count the seconds. And then when they can't take it anymore, they say the word blink. And then if they say the word blink, they're permitted to blink, and the child tells me how long they went. Okay. So I'm not going to make you guys do that, but that's actually a really good um, capturing of what a tick is, right? We're keeping our eyes open. We suddenly have this overwhelming, itchy, burny, I just got a blink, please let me blink. And then we finally get to blink after we say the word blink. How do we feel after we finally get to blink? Uh, what do you think? Relieved. Is it relieved? relieved? Yeah relieved right and when we do blink what's that blink gonna look like is it gonna look like a regular blink or what probably a little more over exaggerated i guess exactly right that is the tick and tourette roller coaster right it's this building up this feeling of i just got to do it please let me do it itchy burning pressure and then we engage in our tick behavior which in this analogy is the blink and then we feel this overwhelming sense of relief which then primes our body to want to do it again. That's the best description I can give parents when they're trying to understand what their child is going through with ticks, right? This is considered the bedrock of Tourette syndrome. So if you're trying to like, you know, float between these differential diagnoses, what you want to ask is to have the child describe that premonitory urge, that feeling they, they have before the tick is coming. If the child does not have a premonitory urge, Sometimes what I might do is send them back to neurology, okay? This is a perfect example. This is a terrible story, but I had a patient that was referred to me, and they were doing this repetitive movement where they would take their thumb and kind of push it under their rib cage over and over and over again. And so when I was um, doing my initial assessment, I asked them about this premonitory urge. And they said, you know, no, it's, I don't have a feeling like that. It's just, I just have to do it. I don't have a feeling like, you know, burny, itchy, anything like that. I thought that that was a little bit strange. Well, then this child ends up getting very sick, goes into inpatient and has a surgery. And what it actually ended up being was that the patient and my medical crew on the call can probably, they know the word for this. Their pa the patient had some type of netting to keep their um, intestines in place from like a at a postnatal situation. And so what they were actually doing was compulsively pushing their intestines back into place because that netting had disintegrated, <sighs> right? 
So it superficially kind of looked like a tick. It was this repetitive behavior, but it was actually because something internally was going on and we were able to figure that out because this child was so intelligent in knowing that they weren't having this premonitory feeling. How wild is that? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Weird, yeah. yeah. So when we actually think about the neurological etiology of ticks, these are the best two descriptions I could find. So I'm just gonna leave this on the screen for a second. This is gonna make you like have crossed eyes and think about grad medical school. So just yeah. take a second to read both of these. So that's a lot, right? So right. this is the hard part about medical school and graduate school, right? We read articles like this, so we have a, a strong understanding of what a tick is. However, that's only half of what we have to do. Now we have to describe it to a family, right? So if we had time and we were sitting together, I would actually have you guys work in partners to think if you could come up with a developmentally appropriate analogy for these to explain to a child. But I'm just gonna give you a couple examples of what we came up with. And Sean is actually gonna get really strong in one of these examples. <laughs> so the basal ganglia is this incredible thing in the brain that pretty much decides what signals get to go through to the body and what signals get rejected, correct? So when I heard about the role of the basal ganglia, I thought that it kind of sounded like a spaghetti strainer, right? So a spaghetti strainer or a colander, as fancy people call it, you know, you put the in, it drains the water out so you have the noodles, right? So when I'm talking to a patient about what Tourette syndrome is, what I will use as my analogy is it's almost like our basal ganglia, our spaghetti strainer holes are too big. So if you had a spaghetti strainer that the holes were too big, what would happen? Everything goes through. Everything goes right. through, right? So this is a really nice analogy that children understand and get, right? When I use this analogy, often what I do, is I will pivot to parents and say that there is no basal ganglia hole shrinker medication, right? There is no medication for Tourette syndrome because Tourette syndrome is a diagnosis of structure and not a diagnosis of chemistry. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. When when patients are on air quotes medication for Tourette syndrome, often they're either treating their comorbidities or they're on a blood pressure type of medication like guanfacine. Okay. Why would guanfacine be used for kids with Tourette syndrome? Oh goodness. Any ideas oh. why that would be? Possible ADHD. Right. So you're you're right there, right? So if my blood pressure is high, how am I feeling? Uh, okay, so you're feeling anxious. physiologically stressed. Anxious stress, uh, right? So if, if chemically I'm on a blood pressure medication that drops my blood pressure, physiologically that takes my body out of a stress place. So that's how ticks decrease, right? So that's why patients that have Tourette syndrome are often on blood pressure medications. Okay. So I give this analogy. This is a true story uh, about the spaghetti strainer. I have a patient that has ADHD and I can tell that he ha is having his own thought in his head when I went through all of this. And then I was like waiting for him to, you know, talk about Legos or something. And he totally from the mouths of babes that heard this and said, you know what I think it sounds like? He said, I think the basal ganglia sounds like a friendly crossing guard. And he said, it's like a friendly crossing guard that's letting everybody cross the street and not letting cars go through. Like I have shivers even thinking about that. And he was like eight. Right. So I had used all of this time, you know, with my postdoc training and my focus on Tourette syndrome to come up with a spaghetti strainer. And an eight year old was like, oh, it's a friendly crossing guard, which I think is probably an even better analogy. For, <laughs> okay. for those of you, I, for those of you that are going into gen peds, what I recommend is coming up with developmental analogies like that for a lot of the chronic conditions that you have. So Dr. Kevin Treemstra, he's a pediatric psychologist. He has a very similar kind of analogy he uses about too many people trying to get through a door to talk about the physiological underpinnings of diabetes, right? So having these great take-home analogies, regardless of the condition that you're working with, is a huge for families. Okay, so we talked about that. John's going to become very familiar with this. This is a brain glove. 
um, if you ever had money in your pocket, this would be something awesome to buy. So this brain glove has all the external structures on the outside, the internal structures on the inside. And so what I actually do is I have a mini spaghetti strainer and we actually put the spaghetti strainer right in the center of the brain glove to show how central the basal ganglion system is. <laughs> so again, here is that roller coaster. So for patients that have Tourette's syndrome, we're riding a premonitory urge. We have a tick, our tick then, we feel relief after we do the tick, but then we're riding up the premonitory urge again, okay? This is often why patients that have Tourette's syndrome might accidentally get diagnosed with ADHD. Many of them have ADHD, but if you think about pretty much doing a staring contest with yourself all the time, every day, you're not gonna pay attention to math class. <laughs> so when we look at Tourette's syndrome and we put a behavioral model of psychology on top of it, this is kind of how I'm gonna introduce this, this thing called CBIT, right? So an antecedent is that triggering condition that's gonna make it likely that a tick is going to happen. So an antecedent for ticks might be stressful things like a place or situation, a mean substitute, you know, starting on the football team, internal experiences of shame or regret or guilt, right? So that kind of sets our stage that's gonna increase the likelihood we're gonna have a tick and then something is causing the tick to be reinforced in the environment, right? So for example, maybe I am a socially isolated student. I'm often bullied. I'm sitting in chemistry class. Um, I'm feeling stressed because that's a subject that's a little bit hard for me. So then all of a sudden I say a really bad word out loud. So maybe I have coprolalia, okay? So suddenly I say this bad word out loud and everybody that usually makes fun of me is now laughing, right? And so for this one moment, I feel socially accepted. I'm like the funny guy, right? So what happens? Am I going to do that tick again? Probably. Probably, right? This is a non-conscious process. So that child isn't like, oh, I'm going to say the S word so that people start laughing, right? But what ends up happening is we have hormones like dopamine that have us have a sense of belonging that makes that system primed again to be more likely to have happen, right? Now let's look at negative reinforcement. So maybe I'm sitting in math class. Math class is really hard for me. I start doing a, what's called a cough habit. So I start coughing over and over and over again in class. What might, might that teacher do if I'm coughing over and over in class? <laughs> uh, probably let him go outside for a drink. Yeah, right. So maybe it's a really nice teacher. And that teacher's trying to be very Tourette informed. And so they go over to that student and say, hey, why don't you take a break? go get a drink, walk around the hall, and come back when you're ready, okay? What accidentally happened from responding to the tick like that? Is it gonna go up or down? Are they gonna do it less or more? More. More, mm -hmm. right? Why? <laughs> Sounds like a reward to me. Exactly, yeah. right? So we accidentally reinforced that tick, right? So take that same that same um, example, and maybe a really mean substitute who tells that child to be quiet, really loud, embarrassingly in front of everybody, right? Am I going to do that tick less or more? I hope less. It would actually be more, more, because if a teacher yells at me in front of everybody, do I feel relaxed or stressed? Oh, uh, stressed. Stressed. Okay, and what does stress do to ticks? Right, increases, yeah. Right? So mm -hmm. this is how we can kind of create a tough environment for ticks in the school system or even at home with family. So when you look at tick treatment, I'm getting old now, so I don't know if you guys remember this. Way back, I mean, probably early aughts, there was an MTV True Life about Tourette's syndrome. Yeah. You guys remember? Okay, good. I remember this. I mean, this was huge. I mean, this is a very controversial True Life because it brought Tourette syndrome to the vernacular of the public, right? Everybody suddenly knew about Tourette syndrome. However, this patient that was profiled, her tics were so extreme that I even remember in high school, people would do like imitations of her. She had coprolalia. Everyone was saying like the same swear patterns that she was saying. So while it brought Tourette syndrome to the forefront, it was pretty extreme to watch. Do you remember that? I remember this. You do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the whole the whole um, story of this MTV True Life was that this um, girl was waiting for something called DBS, 
So DBS is deep brain stimulation. Um, and so what we pretty much do is shoot electrodes into the area where the ticks are to try and blast them out. Um, but you can have pretty significant side effects, right? Infection, stroke, it can make you emotionally blunted. We often use DBS for ticks that are kind of refractory to med medication. So I actually have one patient out of almost 400, one patient that's currently um, awaiting DBS surgery at university hospitals. So our group doesn't do it, but we do have a pediatric team at UH that does it, right? Her ticks, she's, um, she's now graduated college. She's a nursing student. She actually is profiled publicly, so you could probably look her up. Um, her ticks are so profound and so painful, and she has gone through CBIT and tried every medication in the book. So this is the last chance ranch for her, right? Other patients, like I said, are on medical treatments for, I mean, like clonidine, guanfacine, our blood pressure family, treating our side effects. Um, there's some new ideas. So uh, there's like doing mechanical realignment of jaws. There's some research on that. And then obviously using CBD and Marinol. Interestingly, this is new for you guys. We actually have a physician, uh, Dr. Mike Corman. He's um, in neurology. He has done some CBD consults for my patients with Tourette syndrome. So for those of you that have been following CBD being used medically, if you look at the group of patients that are often considered the first group that are going to get that type of treatment intervention, Tourette syndrome is often the front of the line. Okay. Mm. And then finally, behavior therapy. So behavior therapy would be something old school called habit reversal or CBIT, which we're going to talk about next. So let's talk about habit reversal. So Azrin and Nunn were two psychologists in 1973 that used, um, that worked in like adult psychiatric facilities. And what they realized is that if we teach people to be aware of their habits, introduce a competing response and re uh, reward them for when they use that competing response, we can get a whole lot of habits in control. And so Azrin and Nunn ended up being like millionaire psychologists that Sean and I could only dream of becoming because they were able to take this concept and apply it pretty much sex addiction, smoking cessation, chronic eating behaviors. They were able to take this concept and really run with it. And this is actually their book. So you can see it's written in that cool, like 1970s writing. This was prolific for people that were trying to break bad habits. So then Doug Woods, that's actually a picture of him in the center there. Um, in the, I think in the mid nineties, he took this concept of habit reversal and thought, wait, if ticks are pretty much, you know, glorified physiological habits, and we take that core concept of habit reversal and add in patient education about the brain, school outreach, stress management, and what's called a functional intervention. So that was that behavioral slide I showed you. If we put those pieces into habit reversal, I think we have a treatment for CBIT. And so he's considered really the, the godfather of uh, CBIT and Tourette syndrome treatment. Old school neurologists, so some neurologists in the community, some of them are, are more gray hair senior um, neurologists, still call it habit reversal. It makes me want to die inside, but habit reversal is the grandfather <laughs> of CBIT. So CBIT at Akron Children's Hospital, the way it looks is a, really any of you guys could refer to our team, right? We do an intake plus six weekly sessions. And so if I have a patient that I see at Friday 2 p.m., that's their intake, they stay in that slot for seven weeks. I see them every single week, Friday at 2 p.m., okay? I do a developmental interview called the YGTSS. That's the Yale Global Tick Severity Scale. Um, Yale is considered the mothership for both threat syndrome research and anxiety research. And so they developed this um, YGTSS almost, no joke, 200 years ago. So I will tell that to patients because that feels really good kind of coming home and hearing that, you know, that a lot of kids or a lot of adults have gone through the same things as them. So referral wise, this is just a fun trivia question I have for you guys. When you think about who refers to the tick and threat service, obviously you might think about neurology an outside treating therapist, DDP, the ADHD clinic, the primary care doc. But when I look at my referral patterns, the top three are neurology first, and then allergy and pulmonology. So my trivia question for you guys is why would allergy and pulmonology be my in my top three referral people? Can you be like the cough tick more than anything else? Yeah, like what kind of tick might cause a child to go to an allergist? Itching. 
It, yes. Oh, cool. good. It, eye rubbing, you know, no sniffing, throat clearing, right? And so I have a lot of patients that languished with the allergy team for them to suddenly have a light bulb moment to think, wait, this is a tick. Right. Pulmonology, same thing. Right. Throat clearing, a habit cough that never went away. Right. So I and this is an I love telling you guys patient stories. I actually had another patient, true story, um, that had this sniff that wouldn't go away. He had that awful scratch test, you know, an allergy. And they <laughs> thought that he had a deviated septum. So he had a deviated septum surgery. Right. Then had complications from that surgery, then ended up hospitalized for those complications for one of the residents to realize that this was probably a tick and he didn't need to have that surgery after all. How wild is that? <laughs> right? So we can go pretty That's far right. surgically for us to realize it actually was a tick. So when we break down what the sessions look like, I'm gonna kind of go one by one, but I'm gonna be cognizant of the time. Um, so our first session, um, after we do the intake, uh, we do the patient education. So I use that brain glove. I introduce Gilles de la Tourette. I talk about the history of tick treatment. A lot of times parents or uninformed staff or providers might say, why don't you just hold that tick in? I give an example that holding in a tick is like holding in a fart, right? So like if we <laughs> hold in a tick, we're going to feel horribly uncomfortable. Uh, and then when we get to our safe space, so if we use the fart analogy, if we're in like our own private bathroom, we're going to like let her in, right? This is what happens a lot of times with kids with ticks. It's like we decide to hold our ticks in all day at school. And then when we get home, we have these rebound effects of just explosive ticks because we weren't actually letting that energy out in any way. Um, I introduce CBIT. We talk a lot about brains. So my patients, when they graduate CBIT, they know the frontal lobe, they know the motor cortex, they know what executive functioning is. And then we talk about how CBIT actually rewires the brain. We're changing electricity because we're taking something that lives in the automatic motor cortex of the brain and we're adding the frontal lobe in. We're thinking about it. We're talking about it. We're thinking about triggering conditions. So that's how we're changing brain chemistry through behavior intervention. Um, we, we, for our homework, we pick a tick to work on. Um, I always tell the patient to pick the tick they want to work on, not the parents. I don't care if that throat clear is driving them crazy. Um, we never do an eye tick first because eye ticks are notoriously the hardest. And then we pick a prize to work for. So anecdotally, why do you think after session one, we have a massive drop off in ticks? Any idea why that would be? Uh... Gosh, I'm thinking maybe like the habit reversal being aware thing. Yes, yes, exactly, right? We're thinking about them. We're focusing on them. We're talking about where ticks live in the brain, right? So we are engaging in awareness training just by giving the underlying science of ticks, right? So this is usually like a big buy-in from families because they're like, oh my gosh, this is a miracle. Okay. <laughs> Session two is considered old school habit reversal. So we're going to do all of those steps. We're going to identify the urge. We're going to practice awareness training. We're going to come up with a competing response. So a, repeat, a competing response would be a replacement behavior we can do that's less disruptive than, than the tick that we can hold for a minute or until the feeling goes away, whichever one is longer. Okay? I will practice with patients feeling what a minute feels like. So I will look at the clock and tell them to tell me when they think a minute is over. And it's usually like nine seconds, especially my ADHD patients. I think their internal <laughs> clock is just speeding. Um, because that's how long we have to hold a competing response. So for example, if I had like a shoulder crack tick where I was doing this, I would have to come up with an urge that made me doing this impossible. So maybe what I would do is I would maybe tuck my elbow into my hip, right? And then I would hold that position for a minute or until that feeling goes away, whichever one is longer. This is just like that old wives tale where like, if you feel the feeling of sneezing, what are you supposed to do? You guys know this? So uh, maybe not like, stop to it. sneeze. Yeah, like if you if you feel like you're about to sneeze, an old wives' tale says you look at a light. Hmm. Huh. Have you ever heard of that before? I have no clue why that would be, but that's supposed to no, stop the sneeze. Yeah, so it's kind of like that, right? We're like feeling the sensation, coming up with a competing response that's going to make it impossible to happen. Our, oh, the massage little person is here because all of my patients also get massages through the pain clinic. 
So did you guys know that we have a massage team through the pain clinic? That I do know, because I know we do that for a lot of our um, eating disorder patients and our other uh, adolescent patients and patient, and patient, yeah. Yeah, it's amazing, right? So it's like putting in an order for anything else. You can literally put in an order for massage. It's amazing, right? A oh, lot of oh. these CS patients are walking around like little stress monsters, so they don't even know that their body is tense as a rock. And so by just adding a massage order into CBIT, I think that's significantly helpful. I have patients that will graduate CBIT that will call me years later, and I'll just put in a standing order for massage because it's been so beneficial. <laughs> Session three, we wipe out everything and talk about relaxation. Patients with TS, anxiety, OCD, and ADHD are absolutely terrible at relaxing, as you guys know. Um, sometimes what I use to describe it Parents is it's like our our stoplight is either green or red. We don't have a yellow light, and yellow means what? Uh, What's the yellow light mean? It's about slow. Slow, slow down. down. Use <laughs> caution. Approach safely. Right. So by teaching kids how to relax, we're letting them grow a yellow light. Patients with Tourette's syndrome are literally go, 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 go every day. We are just you stress, de-stress, excitement, stress, excitement, stress until we have a burnout crash. And so that's how we take one of our precious CBIT sessions and just totally talk about relaxation. We make a relaxation menu. So Sean's going to get very comfortable in doing this. This is actually an example of a patient, um, a patient's relaxation menu. So if you look at everything on here, you know, some stuff I might disagree with, you know, I don't know if there's evidence backing, you know, Pokemon cards. However, if this is relaxing to Gabriel, we're going to put it on this list. And his homework for this CBIT session is to actually practice relaxing. So he will maybe practice like five out of seven days for 30 minutes and try all of these tricks. Session four, we're back to habit reversal. So maybe picking our second stick. Session five, we talk about something called relapse prevention. Usually by session five, these kids are killing it, right? <laughs> so while we only work with two ticks in CBIT, remember, we don't have to tackle every single tick in CBIT. We're teaching them the process, and then they apply the process to every tick, right? I give the example of Muhammad Ali. So Muhammad Ali is considered one of the greatest boxers of all time. And if you actually look at his statistics, he's not the fastest, not the strongest, doesn't have the longest reach. One of the reasons why he's the greatest boxer of all time is he started the scouting culture. So he would send scouts or he would go in disguise and look at who he was going to box next, learn what they were doing, memorize his defense moves, and just kill him in the, in the ring, right? And so we use this example for patients with a chronic diagnosis that we need to be Muhammad Ali and predict punches. So again, using an endo example, if I have diabetes, I know that going to a birthday party might be a triggering condition for me, right? So what can I do to predict that punch? Maybe I eat celery and carrots before I go there. Maybe I bring my own sugar-free cake before I go there. That's Muhammad Ali predicting a punch before you get blacked out. Session six, um, we spot check all the ticks. So we talk about what's working, what's not. For our younger kids, we give them a little reward if they did all their homework. For our older kids, what we do is I give them my white lab coat that I never get to use. You know, you like work your entire career for that lab coat. And then you're like, eh, <laughs> no one's wearing it around here. You know? So what I actually do is I um, give my patient my lab coat. Um, I walk out of the treatment room. I give them two minutes to go over everything they learned. And then I come in as a patient and they're the doctor. So I'll come in with a tick and they have to step me through every single one of those pieces that they learned. We have a graduation ceremony um, where we have a diploma that's signed by Dr. Lisa Stanford that I present to them. We talk about a sparkle moment. So Sean, that was an idea that came from Dr. Hannah McKillop, who's in Nationwide. Um, all of us talk about a moment where we really saw a patient get it and we celebrate that. And then we take a selfie. And so these are just a couple pictures, my you know, HIPAA violating pictures, but I promise I have um, you know, signed to show you these. I have almost 400 pictures of every CBIT graduate. And so we're going to talk about Tick Night Out next, but I use these pictures in a very important way. So they're really cool now because I'm doing this almost exclusively on telehealth. So I have like telehealth selfies. So these are just some resources for you guys. There's a lot of really incredible firsthand accounts of having Tourette syndrome. I have pretty much all of those books that are up there up top. 
if you ever wanted to borrow one or hear from a child what it's like having Tourette syndrome, just come to me. I have a little lending library that you can borrow it. Mm -hmm. um, the Tourette Association is probably the most organized national association in the country. The resources they have, the staffing that they have. I mean, it, it puts Autism Speaks to shame, truly. I mean, they are so <laughs> accessible. They call families back within a day. Um, they regularly send me, I'm not kidding, 40 pound boxes of prizes and resources for patients. It's just a great website. And so any new, newly diagnosed patient that you have, tell them to go to the Tourette Association to start. And then finally, Camp Twitch and Shout, this is just waiting for a documentary to be made about it. This is actually a Tourette Syndrome summer camp that's paid for in full by the Tourette Association for patients to go. And the kids that have gone to this, I mean, this has changed their life, truly. So um, it's in Georgia. Actually, one of our former fellows was a camp counselor back in the day there, Sean. So finally, if you guys, like, for some crazy reason, statistically never saw a patient with Tourette syndrome ever again, right, or only saw that one when you were in training, the best thing that you can do is advocate, right? So when people hear Tourette syndrome, they think uncontrollable swearing, right? And if you Google Tourette syndrome, these pictures that pop up are some of the first things that come up. And so if you think about a child that might just have a motor tick, or you think about a child that is experiencing co coprolalia, there is no diagnosis that I would say is more made fun of than Tourette syndrome. So, you know, just, you know, correcting gently that attending that might make a comment about Tourette syndrome, or, you know, being very wary of what we post on Facebook, you know, because this truly is a neurological condition that has medical backing, and these patients have to deal with comments like this every single day. Sure, sure. So just a cliff note about coprolalia, that's the technical term for that involuntary outburst of obscene words. Although it's the most widely known uh, symptom of TS, it only occurs in about 10% of patients that have Tourette syndrome. It's very poorly researched. So if you guys were looking for a research project, you could probably, you know, get a seminal paper if you studied coprolalia. And prior to 2000, you had to have coprolalia to meet criteria for Tourette syndrome. So there is an higher generation of our age group and older of patients walking around that have Tourette syndrome, but maybe didn't have coprolalia, and so they have no diagnostic home. Okay, that's heartbreaking, really. Um, so advocacy stuff continuing. June 7th is World Tourette's Awareness Month, and the Tourette Awareness Ribbon is teal. Um, we have a very active parent support group that Sean's probably going to get to know pretty well. Um, they actually lit Tower City teal for the month of June. Oh, it was one of the best moments in my career to see Tower City lit up in teal because of awesome here. <laughs> um, we also have this annual event called Tick Night Out. So Tick stands for Together in the Community. Um, and so we go, the picture down below is uh, Scene 75, which is an indoor amusement park at Brunswick, in Brunswick. Um, yeah. Howard yeah. Anna pays for it in full. So these families can go for no cost and we shut it down and it's just a day for people to rest and to be with each other. And so this was a picture from last summer. So you can see just the amount of kids that are in that amazing picture. Um, it's just the best day ever. Sean's probably going to do some really cool um, program building experiences. This year, because of COVID, obviously we couldn't do scene 75, but don't worry, um, we're planning on doing a drive-in movie theater hosted by Billie Eilish. So we're, uh, we're, in, we're working through that. Wow. Um, as you guys know, Billie Eilish also has Tourette syndrome, um, along with Tim Howard. So they have been incredible advocates uh, for uh, this clinical diagnosis. And so we're looking to see if they will jump on to our drive-in movie theater event. Um, this community outing actually got notice from the Tourette Association, and so they actually designated us a center for excellence last summer. So that is actually a picture of me with the president of the Tourette Association, who took a private jet from New York City to Brunswick to see this event in action. It was just the coolest day ever. Wow. Um, and then so finally, uh, this is this group of kids here. These are the Tourette ambassadors. This is a massive honor um, for Akron Children's Hospital. Until uh, Lindsay Vader, my former fellow who's now at Nationwide, every single year an Akron kid represented the state of Ohio. And so the Tourette ambassadors, there's 50 of these kids, they represent each state in America, and then they work with uh, congressional leadership to make sure that Tourette is in the forefront. They're like young lobbyists, if you will. 
<laughs> so this picture always makes me laugh. Um, the arrow down, that guy in plaid right there, his name is Ethan Harold. Uh, so he um, met with Sherrod Brown. It was the cutest thing ever. He kept calling me that day and like whispering into the phone. It was great. Um, <laughs> I love this picture too, because as you can see, everyone is like in suits and uh, Ohio repping in a plaid shirt, baby. So that always makes me giggle. <laughs> um, one final thing before I close, I will just say that patients with Tourette's syndrome, because of their incredible brains, their IQ is higher than the rest of us mere mortals. So their average IQ is usually 110. Um, they're highly sensitive and highly perceptive because they have that additional neurological activity going on. So if you take an intelligent, sensitive, and perceptive kid, sometimes I can see those superpowers before I ever see a tick. I've had patients that have maybe seen me in school success or when I'm on the floors, and they have that incredible effervescence that only comes with Tourette syndrome. So I see their second. So these, these kids bring me so much joy to my life. You know, I never would have guessed when I was in training like you guys that I would have landed in Tourette syndrome, but what an absolute treat. I mean, you get to see kids get better too, and you never really get to see that a lot in medicine. So that's it. So any um, questions that you guys have, anything I can do to support you? Not right now, but if I uh, end up practicing in the area, I'll have to keep you guys in mind yeah. for sure. <laughs> Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, I think it's eye-opening to know that that's, that's so common, I guess, um, you know, even beyond just the, you know, co like I said earlier, the comorbid um, diagnoses that can come along with it. It's, it's um, my, my, my wife's a teacher, so it's kind of interesting to sometimes hear her take on things and see if she notices some of those things, too. I'm sure she probably does when she thinks about it. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, they're just so, they're, I think being sensitive and perceptive and smart, too, they're just little jokesters. Like when I have trainees with me that are in CBIT, I describe them as koi fish. You know, have you you guys know what koi fish are? Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. So koi fish expand to fill the whatever container they're in, and those are those are TS patients, right? So if you.